This morning we spoke of the Ascended Master's teachings as showing us how to narrow the gap between the self-awareness of a human consciousness and the self-awareness of a Christ consciousness. The Ascended Masters provide those teachings whereby we put off the old man and put on the new. Key to these teachings is the science of the spoken word. I mentioned this book, which we have published, and I will be lecturing from it. If you have a copy, you might like to take it out at this time. The science of the spoken word has come down in every religion, every adoration that man has had of God through the ages. For man has attempted to verbalize his adoration, and by so doing, by employing the spoken word, he has merged with the word, the logos of God. On page 12 of this book, we have definitions of forms that have been used by mankind in the exercise of the throat chakra. First, there is the prayer. Prayer is a devout petition to or any form of spiritual communion with God or an object of worship. A spiritual communion with God or an object of worship as in supplication, thanksgiving, adoration, or confession. A formula or sequence of words used in or appointed for praying. The Lord's Prayer is such an example. It is a petition or an entreaty. Maitreya, in his statement on the overcoming of fear through decrees, explains to us that prayer represents a certain development, a certain level on the path of initiation. Prayer can never be dispensed with, but it can be added to. As long as we dwell in the footstool kingdom, we will pray, Our Father who art in heaven. But we can add to the prayer the more masterful exercises of the spoken word, such as the invocation, the mantra, the chant, the decree, and the fiat, the affirmation, and the call. Let us consider each of these. The invocation, the act of invoking or calling upon a deity, spirit, for aid, protection, inspiration, or the like, supplication, any petitioning or supplication for help or aid, a form of prayer invoking God's presence, said especially at the beginning of a public ceremony, a call to God or to beings who have become one with God to release power, wisdom, and love to mankind, or to intercede in their behalf, supplication for the flow of light, energy, peace, and harmony to come into manifestation on earth as it is in heaven. An invocation is a call it is going within for the action of the call. And we understand when we give an invocation, as with each of these forms, that it is God in us who is making the application. In other words, God is invoking. God is the invocation itself, and God is the answer or the return current of energy in answer to the invocation. An invocation can be made by you because the Christ, the light, lives within you. Jesus said, Whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Calling in the name of Jesus the Christ, making an invocation in his name, by cosmic law, must always receive the answer. But not only in the name of Jesus the Christ, but in the name of every other son or daughter of God who was ever united with the Christ. This law is universally applicable, and it means that you can call in the name of your own Christ self to God and to God individualized as your own I Am Presence. If you see an accident happening, you are on the scene. You can release the energy for healing, for harmony, for help to those involved in the following manner. In the name of Jesus the Christ, 
I call to the heart of God for divine assistance, for divine intercession, for light to descend, and for the protection of all those involved. Let thy will be done, O God. The practicing of the art of invocation makes perfect as with anything else. The fact that you have a right to make an invocation puts you way out front in terms of spiritual evolution. By cosmic law, unfailingly, that invocation is answered because you have followed the rules of invocation. And these rules are not just biblical. They are written on every erg of energy that has come forth from God. We looked at the chart of the Divine Presence and we saw the Mediator as the Christ. The Christ is the Logos. John described the coming of the Christ in Jesus as the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his light, the light and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So the Word, the Logos, the Christ, the universal Christ and the Christ Self are all at the same frequency, the same vibration, the same level of consciousness as your own personal mediator. This is the second person of the Holy Trinity. So by that word, without which was not anything made that was made, by the action of that word, energy will coalesce in matter, in the physical plane, in the mental, emotional, and etheric planes, to bring about that which you invoke. Jesus made continual petitions, prayers, and invocations to God. He always concluded them with the statement, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This turns over to the Logos and to the presence within you, the authority to correct those calls or invocations which may not be in keeping with the will of God. We read about asking in prayer and asking amiss and not receiving the answer because our calls are not in keeping with the will of God. Paul discusses this. He speaks about people invoking the energy of God and then consuming it upon their lusts, taking that energy and using it for the pleasures of the senses. This shows that Paul also understood the science of invocation and of the spoken word, and he knew that it was a means to release God's energy in the world of the disciple. He also knew that the disciple would have free will to use or misuse that energy. And so he knew that those who invoked energy and light and then misused it were cut off, and therefore they did not receive an answer after they had shown themselves to be misusers of the word or of the logos. So he said, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. You can always be certain then that when you give an invocation, you are releasing energy as a mathematical formula, following law, the law of mathematics, the law of the frequencies of the chakras. And that because we are yet a portion of ourselves in the human consciousness, because we may be subject to error in our calls, that if we add this phrase, in the name of Jesus the Christ, I call to the heart of God for healing for this soul. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You can see that that is a perfect formula whereby you will not increase the weight of your karma or your debts to life because you have wrongly called forth the light of God where the will of God was not in harmony with your call. There is nothing wrong with having a prayer that is a formula. A formula means that by the energy of the word, as you release that word through the throat chakra, it coalesces, and by and by you will be able to see this process, the energy coalesces in the physical, mental, emotional, and etheric bodies almost like filings line up on a magnet or like you see drawn a complicated molecular formula like the DNA chain. It is an assemblage of cosmic energies that come together in a unique pattern. It is a formula, and each time you release that energy, in a certain way, with a certain wording, that same pattern will go forth 
to coalesce light in the plains of Mater. This is where the mantra comes from. The mantra is a mystical formula or invocation, a word or formula often in Sanskrit to be recited or sung for the purpose of intensifying the action of the Spirit of God in man. Jesus journeyed to the east before the age of 30, and he studied in the temple of the Blue Lotus under Lord Himalaya, who will speak to us this evening. Certain other masters of the Himalayas gave Jesus certain formulas which he later released. For instance, the mantra, I am the resurrection and the life. That came forth from the retreats of the Himalayas. That is a formula. That is a mantra. Each time that word is spoken, the exact consciousness of the Christ mind coalesces in matter, that same mind which was in Christ Jesus. The reason we repeat the words of Christ, many of his statements are formulas, is because each time we repeat them, we have the energy of his electronic presence, of his overcoming victory, which we, by our free will, re-anchor in the planes of matter for the increase of the victory, for the victorious overcoming. I am the light of the world. He that believeth in me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Those who are students of the masters in the East would take that mantra and perhaps repeat it a hundred or a thousand times a day. They would sit in meditation in the lotus posture before the image of a great guru, a saint, or of Jesus Christ. They would, with absolute concentration, meditate upon the eyes, the form, and the love of that master. They would think of that master while repeating those words. By the repetition of the words at the level of the throat chakra, they are putting on and becoming the momentum of the master. By the attention of the eyes and the vision of the eyes, they are taking in the atoms and molecules that are the outline of his identity. The path of chila and master, then, is a path whereby the chila, evolving toward the Christ consciousness, is assisted because he puts on the mantle or the momentum of his guru, of his master, who has energized and coalesced in his aura an extraordinary amount of energy and light from the God presence. We had the occasion to visit the caves where the Jains, the Jainist monks, have been giving mantras for thousands of years. These same mantras given over and over as Sanskrit formulas are repeated today by modern disciples. When you learn some of these Sanskrit mantras and you repeat them, you find that the momentum of everyone who has ever given them is unlocked each time they are spoken. And so you tie into a chain of disciples leading back to the source of life. This is why they are so powerful. And yet, because Jesus said that the prayers should not be vain repetition as the heathen do, Christians have the mistaken concept that if you repeat a prayer more than once, it is vain repetition. Maitreya, in his lecture, which is contained in this book, says that this is not so. He says, my words and the words of the Ascended Masters are not vainly repetitious because they are infused with life and with meaning. And as long as you repeat a mantra with love, with feeling, with adoration to God, you are not vainly repeating those words. Therefore, the vain repetition is in the individual, not in the process. And there is an exact science and there is a reason why when we give decrees, and invocations, we give them three times or nine times because we understand certain cycles of the release of God's energy which come through reinforcing by the power of the spoken word the alchemical formula of the decree or the mantra here in time and space. The fact is that God is perfect in his plane, that we are here to perfect this plane and in the process gain self-mastery. Energies that are perfect and the full momentum of God's consciousness 
does not coalesce or anchor in this plane unless we, by our determination, by our free will, choose to draw that energy down to this level and anchor it in the seven chakras. The science of the spoken word, the use of the throat chakra, is the means whereby God's energy, locked in spirit, is released in matter. It is very precise. I'm going to give you the opportunity to try these invocations. It is an exact science. Since it is a science, there's only one way to prove whether or not it works, and that is to try. If you don't try out this science, you will never know because the science must be proven by the individual. So if you have never decreed before or given mantras or invocations, you must become the scientist in the laboratory of your soul and prove whether or not this, which only exists as a theory as yet for you, whether or not this theory holds true. And I don't want you to accept any theory or any statement that I make because I make it. I want you to only accept it when you have proven it to be true within yourself. The chant is another form of the use of the science of the spoken word. It's a short, simple melody, especially one characterized by single notes to which an indefinite number of syllables are intoned, used in singing the psalms, canticles, in the church service. The Gregorian chants, which were used at a certain period of Christianity, were a means of anchoring the radiation of Jesus Christ and Mary the Mother and the angelic hosts in the cathedrals of Europe. It was a very important service that was rendered, and so the choirs of today, when they are singing according to the correct frequencies, also anchor the vibrations of spirit in matter. In both East and West, the name of God is chanted over and over again in the ritual of atonement, whereby the soul of man becomes one with the spirit of God by intonation of the sound of his name. This is given in Sanskrit as Om, or Om Tat Sat Om. In English, as I am that I am. By sounding the name of God or that of a member of the heavenly host, the vibration of the being is simulated, and thereby being itself is drawn to the one chanting. Therefore, chants, when properly used, magnetize the presence, whether universal or individualized, of the divine consciousness. The paths of East and West are complementary. The path of the East is the path of spirit of the masculine ray. The path of the West is the path of the divine mother and of the feminine ray. In many aspects, the religions of East and West reflect both the paths of father and of mother. The statement Om or Om Tat Sat Om is an intonation and a chant whereby the energy of your being, of your chakras, all that is locked in imperfection, begins the spiral of the ascension and returns to the heart of the God presence. It is a very powerful chant. And if you give it with sincerity, the whole cosmos of your being begins to move Godward. Om Mani Padmi Hum is another such chant. In the West, the formula of the name of God was given to Moses, as I am that I am. By that prayer, you are affirming that the energy which has ascended to God, which is in God, is now your identity, your being. You're saying, I am that I am. I am here in form in my heart is the same I am that is above. It's the formula for the affirmation, as above, so below. The path of mother or mater is the path of mater realization. The realization of the mother and the mother flame is drawing forth the energy of the father and coalescing that energy in form for the sacred alchemy of your becoming the Christ. Now if you go the full circle of the path of east and west, you have the full complement of this chant. Om Tat Sat Om, energy ascends. I am that I am, energy descends. The combination of the two creates the flow. The flow is the action of the caduceus. The flow is the action 
of the alpha and omega spirals on the spine for the raising of the kundalini, the perfect balance of the father-mother God. All of this can be achieved so much more quickly than in silent meditation because you have added to the power of your mind, to the power of your inner willing and your inner adoration, the action of the throat chakra that instantaneously releases light and energy in this octave. There is no other replacement for that throat chakra. It is the word and the logos. May we, for the unification of us in the word and in the logos, repeat these two mantras, Om Tat Sat Om. your attention on the sphere of light that is your I am presence above you. Raise your hands and feel the flow of life within you from the tips of your toes up to the presence, returning all the energy that God has given to you back unto him for purification. Meditate upon your heart as the seat of life, the seat of the authority of your Christ consciousness. See your heart as a sphere of white fire and affirm within that heart, I am that I am. ways of giving these two chants. You can step up the momentum and the action of the light by saying I am that I am quickly and lightly. I am that I am I am that I am I am that I am I am that I I am that I am 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 I am The science of the spoken word is always accompanied by the science of real eye magic, as it is called. It is the action of the third eye whereby you envision exactly what you are giving forth through the throat chakra. In other words, you hold in the chalice of your third eye the vision, the inner sight of God himself, of that which you desire to manifest, and that which will coalesce in your world because you release the energy of the throat and hold the vision of the third eye. Therefore, meditation includes the centering in the heart, the action of the throat, the realization of the third eye as the basic trinity of meditation. Without these three, you will reduce the effectivity of your mantras, your meditations, or your decrees. So remember, the heart being the center you must be centered in the flame. The spoken word intones the sound that coalesces the atoms, and the third eye is the vision of that which will take place. We come to the decree. The term decree, as we use it, is not defined in the dictionary. It is a foreordaining will, an edict, or fiat, a foreordaining of events 
To decree is to decide, to declare, to command, or enjoin, to determine or order, to ordain. The decree is the most powerful of all applications to the Godhead. It is the command of the Son or Daughter of God made in the name of the I Am Presence and the Christ for the will of the Almighty to come into manifestation as above, so below. It is the means whereby the kingdom of God becomes a reality here and now through the power of the spoken word. It may be short or long and usually is marked by a formal preamble and a closing or acceptance. Decrees, then, are the byword of the chilas of the ascended masters. By decrees, the chila keeps his four lower bodies and his consciousness in alignment with the master, with the presence of the ascended master. You can always note the difference between a chila who has a momentum of decrees and a chila who does not. At least I can always note it because I can always see the aura, whether or not it is filled with particles of light and a radiance of the Christ, or whether or not it is filled with particles of darkness, almost as soot, energy that coalesces there, no matter how sincere the chila may be. It is energy that is from the world, from interaction with the world, from friction with the world. And until the decree, by the power of the spoken word, infuses the aura with a violet flame, with the action of the seven rays, the aura is not cleaned, it's not purified, because only the light of the Christ and of the Holy Spirit can transform that darkness into light. Now we go from the decree to the fiat. A fiat is a more intense decree. It is an authoritative decree, a sanction, order, or pronouncement. A short dynamic invocation or decree usually using the name of God, I am, as the first word of the fiat. Sometimes the difference between a decree and a fiat is the difference between your awareness of yourself as God and as the living presence of God. When you give a fiat, you are absolutely affirming the perfection of God here and now by the power of the living Christ and by the power of the I am that I am. In the consciousness of the fiat, you are allowing the authority of Almighty God to speak through you. Down through the ages, there have been prophets, Jesus, Moses, Joshua, Isaiah, Abraham, Gautama Buddha, Maitreya, who have uttered fiats, and by these fiats, an entire course of civilization has been turned completely aside. You remember the fiat that Jesus made when Lazarus was in the tomb. He didn't beg God. He didn't use a mantra repeating over and over. He used a fiat, and the fiat was to the sleeping consciousness of the human. He said, Lazarus, come forth. It was a fiat that broke the stupor of death, and Lazarus came forth. It was a necessary release by the power of the spoken word to shatter the density of death. Great healers of all time have used the fiat to coalesce energy, to break the momentum of self-hypnosis. Fiats are always exclamations of Christ's power, Christ's wisdom, and Christ's love, consciously affirmed and accepted in the here and now. Then there is the affirmation. I am affirming the action of God in me. The assertion that something exists or is true, confirmation or ratification of the truth, solemn declaration. Affirmations are fiats which may be of greater length and more specific detail. They affirm the action of truth in man. In his being, consciousness, and world, they are used alternately with denials of the reality of evil in all of its forms. For instance, I can affirm, God in me is reality. God in me is truth, health, wholeness, and life. And I can alternate that with the statement, and there is no death, disease, there is no darkness and no night, because God is the allness of my being and myself here and now. The alternating of the affirmation and the denial is an important way in which you attune your consciousness with the Christ self. It has its place, but it is not complete without decrees, because decrees release the energy 
that bring the affirmation to pass within you. Affirmations and denials are like prayer and fasting. The prayer of affirming God reality and then by denial, the fasting of the human consciousness, letting it die, cutting off the supply of energy to it. Then there is the call, a demand, a claim, a request, or command to come or be present. An instance of asking for something, the act of summoning the Lord or the Lord's summoning of his offspring. The Lord has called mankind through the ages, and mankind have called God through the ages. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Out of Egypt have I called my son. To call is to speak in a loud or distinct voice, so as to be heard at a distance, to recall from death or the astral plane. The command, Lazarus, come forth, is also a call, as well as a fiat. To utter a loud or distinct voice, to announce or read loudly or authoritatively. The call is the most direct means of communication between man and God, and God and man, frequently used in an emergency, for example, Oh God, help me. Archangel Michael, take command. The byword of the initiate is, the call compels the answer. That is a statement of cosmic law. When you call God, the return energy comes back. You cannot dictate its terms or what the answer will be. But when you call, the answer is given instantaneously. You may not perceive the answer immediately, but the answer is there. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. So all these forms of communication are uses of the throat chakra. Now I think one of the most important aspects of the science of the spoken word that needs to be dealt with is the matter of whether or not we are worthy of commanding the energies of God of taking these energies, of calling them forth in the name of the Christ. It is important then that we establish who has given us the authority to make these invocations. Where is that authority derived from? And can we be absolutely certain that we do have the right to make calls, to make demands upon life and the energies of life? To me, the prophet Isaiah gives the answer and teaches better than I can teach where this authority comes from. The prophet Isaiah was a high initiate of the Great White Brotherhood. He had great vision of God, and he saw what would come to pass in the nation of Israel. It was he that perceived the coming of the rod of Jesse, the branch, and so this is the word that was given to Isaiah. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. If man did not require the girding of the Lord, a circle of protection that God alone is qualified to give, then the Lord would not make provision for it when man does not even know him. The following verse makes clear the requirement of the law regarding the manifestation of God's grace in his protection. This is from Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord is the law of the word. The Holy One of Israel. The sacred unifier. The one fire of all that is real. And his maker. The originator of man. The I am presence. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons. Ask me for dispensations of mercy on behalf of my offspring. And concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. Here God is asking you not only to petition him for grace and mercy, that these might abound on earth as in heaven, but also to command him to command his energy to do his will in and through you, to work his works upon earth and in your life. He is in fact telling you that you must command him to descend into your being if you would experience him in consciousness. Why is this so? The reason is plain. God gave you the gift of free will and the responsibility to take dominion over the earth, thereby relinquishing his own jurisdiction in the footstool kingdom. If in the daily exercise of free will and in the course of taking dominion over the earth, you desire the assistance of the Most High, 
you must command him to descend into your world, into your life, in the same manner as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, in the imperative, saying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Even in the Lord's Prayer, the most simple form of communion, there are fiats released, and that is how Jesus taught us to pray. Giving God commands, give us this day our daily bread, that is a fiat. By consciously willingly united your forces with God's, making your will one with and subject to the divine, and then commanding the Almighty to enter your world and to exercise his dominion, you return to him the authority that he gave to you. That is the heart of free will. Free will means you have the opportunity to return to God the authority that he first gave to you. In this manner, the soul is infilled and infired with the spirit of God, and you become the supreme manifestation of God's authority, his will and his dominion on earth. The ritual of asking that you might receive, of seeking that you might find, of knocking that the door might be opened is the key to self-mastery through conscious cooperation with God. If you would conquer this synthetic image in self and society, you must replace the relics of its sinful sense of subservience to an angry, vengeful God with the scientific understanding of the cosmic law that states the call compels the answer. If you find it hard to believe that mortals could be vested with the authority to command God, let us explain that when the Lord says, Command ye me, he is speaking directly to the real man whom he hath made and not to the synthetic image. You might say, I'm not fully manifesting the real man. John the Beloved said, until your synthetic consciousness is replaced by the real, you have an advocate with the Father, the Christ, in whose name you may, with the full authority of your God presence, command the energies of the Holy Spirit into action. There you have the essence of why and how this law is applicable. The real you, your real self, your Christ self, has the authority to command the energies of your I am presence. This is why. Hundreds of years later, after Isaiah spoke and heard the word of God saying to him, Command ye me, Jesus said, Whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. The exact same law, repeated again, shows us that we have a right to command God if we command in the name of the Christ, whether in the name of Jesus the Christ, the Christ self, or in the name of any son or daughter of God who has become one with that Christ. This is the mathematics of being. It is not really complex, but to understand it, you need to be imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no question that the Bible has been tampered with. What is there is indeed the living word of God. What concerns me is what is not there, what has been omitted. The warning went forth at the end of the book of Revelation. Any man that tampers with this book, his name is going to be stricken from the book of life. That warning was given by Jesus to John, the beloved, who wrote down the book of Revelation, because Jesus already knew and saw that his teaching and his word had been tampered with and would be tampered with. The fallen ones who have infiltrated the church for 2,000 years have carefully deleted every aspect of truth that would relate you to your real self, your Christ self, and your God mastery. Because of these deletions, we have to return to what remains as sacred writ with the Holy Spirit and extract the living truth, not as dogma and doctrine, but as the living law of the cosmos. God did not intend mankind to be slaves to a civilization, a corrupt economy, a corrupt government, to continually be milked of their light, to remain as vegetables, 
and to not know who they really are. God did not intend this. Jesus did not intend it. The fact remains that civilization is crumbling. The pollution of the environment is becoming such a threat that the entire planetary body is sick with a cancer of human bondage and human hatred. Midst all of this, can we really say that we have the word and the teaching that is for our soul's liberation? If it were there, if the true teachings of Buddha and Christ were there, we would not be in the state that we are in. But we have had the true wheat, the true germ of our identity taken from us, and what is left is the husk, the husk of life. So you can see that where there have been major deletions of the understanding of the law, the ascended masters have filled in with their teachings and with the interpretation of the Holy Spirit. Because they have been found worthy to be received by God, all who are made one with a real image are worthy to command him into action in the world of form. Now all of the decrees and invocations which you will find in our book for Keepers of the Flame, Invocations and Decrees for Keepers of the Flame, are based on this science, that any call made in the name of the Christ to God, to the I Am Presence, to the ascended hosts of light, is instantaneously answered and delivers into this octave energy that coalesces reality. That essentially, then, is the teaching of the science of the spoken word. There is much more that can be said, and it is all contained in this book. If you will study it, you will find kernels of truth continually being revealed. It's very interesting that God said, My word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The word shall not return unto me void. We are made in the image and likeness of God. That which God claims for himself, God in us claims for the manifestation of God. We must realize, because the Bible says, that by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The power of the spoken word, everything that proceeds from the mouth returns to the being and consciousness of the individual. This is the law of energy in action. The misuse of the throat chakra results in all types of disease, most notably throat cancer, lung cancer. We find that the plagues of our misuses of the chakras are upon us in this age because we're living in the end of times when all that which has been sown over thousands of years is coming back full circle into the four lower bodies of individuals. We find that the cure for cancer has not been found because cancer is the returning to the four lower bodies of all of the energy that has been misqualified. What does man have then as the mercy of the law and the mercy of God to intercede for him when all of his misuses return to his doorstep? What can he do? Is he the victim of his karma? No, he is not the victim of his karma unless he chooses to be the victim of his karma. He has the authority of the Christ. He has the knowledge of the sacred fire of the Holy Spirit and of the violet flame, which when invoked, will transmute that energy before it destroys him. Are we going to be destroyed by our karma? Are we going to allow the planet to be destroyed by our karma? No. We're going to use the power and the science of the spoken word. And in the invocation of the light of God that never fails, we have dispensations of mercy for the transmutation of that energy before it manifests as the plagues and the wars and the rumors of wars and all that has been prophesied as the coming of the end of the age. Something to understand about prophecy is that prophecy can always be changed by the law of free will. 
God has always told mankind what would come upon the world if mankind did not respond and follow the teachings and the laws of God. God has always promised that if mankind would keep his covenants, that all would be well. We see then that until the crystal is crystallized, until the mist or the energy becomes crystallized in form, there is always that moment of choice when it can be changed, when it can be reversed. So the action of the light of your own God presence is sufficient unto all manifestations in your life. Every energy veil, e-veil, energy veil, is the name for evil. Any evil that comes upon you is an energy veil, which at some time or another in your past existence you have created by the misuse of free will. Unwittingly, unknowingly, perhaps ignorantly, perhaps maliciously, yet you have created it. You are the creator you will have to come to grips with that which you have created. So then, karma comes, it returns. What do we do? We begin with a violet flame because it is the action of mercy, forgiveness, freedom, and transmutation. There is a mantra that is given to keepers of the flame which you can begin giving right now. And the moment you begin giving it, you can begin to experience freedom buoyancy and light in your world. It simply is, I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. And it means, God in me is a being of violet fire. God in me is the purity God desires. If you don't like yourself or what you see in the mirror, you can change it by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the violet flame. If you don't like what you see, you can be what you want to be, but you need the sacred ingredient for the sacred formula of alchemy. And that ingredient is the Holy Spirit and specifically the seventh ray aspect of the Holy Spirit. May we give this mantra together. Will you see violet flame pulsing and coursing through your veins, through your blood, through your nervous system, through your brain, your heart, your chakras, until you are literally a being of violet fire. Together. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire. I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires, I am a being of violet fire, I am the purity God desires. I am a being of the fire and the beauty got his eyes. I'm a being of the fire and the beauty got his eyes. I'm a being of the fire and the beauty got his eyes. I'm a being of the fire and the beauty got his eyes. I'm a being of the fire and the beauty got his eyes. As you give that mantra day by day, exercising the action of the flame within your being, it flushes out poisons and toxins in all levels of consciousness, etheric, mental, emotional, and physical. The pollution of our microcosm, of these four lower bodies, is transmuted by the violet flame. 
When we transmute that pollution, then we have the authority to transmute the pollution of our earth, and then we have the mastery to execute that authority. So mastery begins here. Because mankind have not followed the teachings of Christ these 2,000 years, because they have failed to pass the initiations of the Christ consciousness, they are not ready now for the challenges that have gone from the level of the personal microcosm to the planetary macrocosm. We find ourselves then living on a world that is shaky, that's rocky, and we're not quite certain what is going to happen to this spaceship that we're on. Not quite sure because the human consciousness is unpredictable, it is volatile. We see then we cannot leave the old polluted areas and find a new world or a new space because the planet is completely covered with pollution from the North to the South Pole. The only way to reverse the tide, to renew the planet, to make it habitable, to make it defensible against interplanetary invasion, the only way to separate it as a sphere of light into which souls of light can come is to inundate it with the action of the Holy Spirit of the violet flame. This is the most important fundamental teaching of the Ascended Masters. Thank you.